Good afternoon, friends. It is good to be with you. We will go ahead and start our spring 2024 RISE training for this administration season. Uh, just as a friendly reminder, um, we will be recording this training, so it will be available on our YouTube channel um, within the next few days. Our support specialist, Emily Ng, is usually really good about getting that up within about 24 hours, and I can also put the link in the uh, upcoming assessment director meeting that will happen next week. And then it will also be in some subsequent memos just as a reminder and you can share that out as needed. Uh, the slides can also be um, shared with you as well. We'll share those through Midas and I will also include a link for those um, in the AD memos as well, okay? So with that, just a couple of things. Uh, make sure that we can see your first and last name as well as your LEA on your Zoom name. Uh, Kim Rathke, our testing coordinator, uh, is monitoring the chat for us today as, long, as well as a couple of our other USBE team and some of our team from CAI, our vendor for the RISE test, okay? Okay, so with that, we are going to be looking in depth today at the RISE system. This includes the portal, its resources, how to administer summative tests, as well as the test appeals process and data cleanup, which as LEA users, you have the responsibility to take care of. So hopefully by the end of today's training, you feel confident to train other users in your LEA and provide any support as needed. Here's a reminder for the availability of the benchmark modules and interim assessments. They're currently open and they're going to remain open through the dates that are listed. All interim assessments need to be completed and submitted, though, by the end of the day on March 1st. Um, any expired interim assessments cannot be reopened after this date and no interim assessments are available after that date. Uh, the benchmarks, though, remain available through the end of your school year for most, if not all of you. Uh, Mid-year summative tests are well underway, if not already completed for many of you. Any incomplete mid-year summative tests are going to force complete if they aren't submitted by students on or before March 1st. For spring summative, LEAs have eight weeks within the window to complete testing. We do not recommend testing the last week of your school year, though, as there are lots of activities, interruptions, lots of other unintended circumstances which tend to creep up. So just take that into consideration. If those dire circumstances do arise, you will need to have USB approval to do that. And you can email Kim Rafke if, if you end up having to test that last week, but it is not recommended. Uh, I've included a link to the AD resource guide here as well, if you need more guidance on setting windows of test availability. You should already be registered for portal updates, but if not, you'll want to do that so that you're receiving immediate updates for any outages, updates to resources, things like that. Uh, the secure browser is required to be installed on all student devices for administering summative assessments. Instructions for installation are in the technology resources link found under the initial resources section of the RISE portal. Uh, we're going to look at resources more closely here in a little bit. Make sure you refer to the supported browsers, though, before updating any system. There are troubleshooting guides for various operating systems in the technology resources that are provided on the RISE portal as well. But if you have issues with the secure browser on a device, you're going to want to reach out to your technology specialist. Uh, we also recommend not using the auto update option for devices, as that doesn't always ensure that the operating system can be supported throughout the testing season. When it comes to preparing for summative administration, we recommend working with students to complete training tests in each of the content areas that they will be expected to test. It's really the best way to familiarize ourselves and our students with the functionality of the system. Uh, it also will expose them to the various item types, administration procedures, as well as the global tools, it allows you to also ensure local technology configurations are validated to ensure that the summative assessment can be administered without issue. Students can familiarize themselves with those global tools in a really low stakes environment. So it's really good to give those training tests in all presented content areas, as some components are very content specific, 
like the calculator or the lack thereof of calculator. So in fact, when it comes to remote testing, we're actually advising you to complete a training test just prior to your actual summit of administration as well, because it will allow you one more chance to ensure that teachers and students, as well as their devices, are ready to go in that low stakes environment. So when it comes to remote testing, it will also provide you with one more opportunity to communicate with your students in a secure manner prior to beginning your test administration for the summative test. Uh, with the training tests, they are provided on the RISE portal. They don't require RISE login credentials, but I do recommend practicing a training test with the credentials so students, especially your younger students, those third graders and fourth graders who haven't had that much exposure with it, if any, get the feel for the process. Uh, here you can see the two types of the training tests. The training test option is the public guest login option, and it's very simple. It doesn't require a proctor and sign-in. This is great for teachers and staff to familiarize themselves with, the, with what the platform looks like and how it functions like, especially if they're new or if they've forgotten over the, few, over the season of what it would look like. This can be used as an informative tool for parents as well. If there's any question about what it looks like or what types of questions will students see on RISE, the test administration option allows you to administer a training test in a test session to really mirror the RISE process, which requires SSID login credentials, the valid SSID, and the secure browser. These are far more useful when prepping for test administration because RISE login credentials, the, that whole idea, it really mirrors the whole summative process start to finish. And if you've been taking advantage of the interim assessments or the benchmark modules, you've been able to practice this login process as well. Uh, but this is, it's required for any student completing the RISE assessments, both in person and remotely, okay? It's also going to allow you to practice the communication tools within the secure system if you are in one of our remote testing locations. So once you've accessed your training test, you're going to need to select your grade level as well as the content of the te training test you wish to take. Remember that these are grade banded. The content is not single grade specific. Uh, the purpose is to become familiar with the system itself and the tools that are provided. So it's important to help students and teachers understand that content mastery is not the purpose of the training test. Um, and if you're using the system to mirror summative administration, you're also going to be able to verify accommodations and ensure resources are applied and they work correctly. Again, once accommodations or those resources have been assigned and tied to an individual student account, students can sign in with their username and their SSID for any form of administration, whether it be practice or not, and have those available. Um, an enhancement from last year to just kind of remind you about is the Spanish adaptive functionality. Guidance for how to access this functionality is provided in the TAM starting on page 45. When this functionality is selected on the training test, students will be able to toggle between the content presented in Spanish and in English using the change languages tool that's provided in the upper right corner with the other tools. So we're gonna stop for a minute. Do we have any questions on RISE availability, whether it be for benchmarks, interims, or summative? Any questions about the training tests or the secure browser? Those three things. I promise we'll get to accommodations, we'll get to setting up sessions, those types of things. So try to limit your questions to these three specific components, if you have any. You can drop them in the chat. Okay, we'll go ahead and keep going. Oh, Jumana, good question. Projecting a benchmark. So there is guidance in the TAM specifically on how you can review benchmarks with students. If you send me an email, I can shoot you the very, like the exact page numbers. But essentially, yes, you can review benchmark items with your students after they have completed the assessment. Okay, and again, there's guidance in the TAM specifically for that. Okay. Chelsea, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. How are these different from the benchmark modules? Do you mean the interim?
the interim assessment is like a shortened version of the summative and can be uh, considered predictive of summative, whereas benchmarks are very standard specific, um, used as a formative tool, not a training test. It's a, it's a formative instructional tool, whereas the training test is to familiarize students with the system, if that helps at all. Okay, perfect. All right, we're going to go on and look at the RISE resources and systems. If another question comes up, go ahead and drop it in the chat. We have people looking there so they can help answer anything that you might uh, have questions for. So with the RISE resources and the systems that are available to you in the RISE portal, they appear here on the left side of your screen. This is just a quick overview of what each of these separate sections provides. You'll see there are five different tabs to choose from, along with an abbreviated version of what you'll find or be able to do in each of those sections. We're not going to look at the benchmark module previewing tab today because we're focusing on some of it summative administration. But if you have questions about that, you're welcome to reach out to me or it's also covered in the training that was held um, in September. And you can go back and uh, view that section as well. So we're going to start with the resources at the top. The resources tab houses the tech resources previously mentioned, as well as other helpful user guides like the TIDE user guide, the TAM, the reporting guide. All of these documents are helpful to use before, during, and after testing. So while they're available online, you can print certain sections for ease of reference and use those at any time. To find these helpful documents, as well as others, you just select the user guide folder under Browse, and then here is just a tied user guide overview. The tied user guide is really helpful for before testing as it's where you'll edit and modify any user accounts or user defined rosters. Uh, as a friendly reminder for you, no changes can be made to a system defined roster because those are automatically created with the Utrex sync. However, you can still create your own rosters for teachers um, who might be in a co-teaching experience or because the students are only going to roster to one teacher that they're originally assigned to. It's also nice if you're collecting data on a small group of students who may not be in the same class so that it's all in one place. Okay, so those are user defined rosters and you can edit those if you choose to. Other important information you'll find in the TIDE user guide is guidance on adding accommodations, how to enter participation codes, uh, the test appeals process, um, as a reminder, as we're going through here, approval of the test appeals is only available to school administrators or LEA level users. So you'll want to make sure that you're watching for those if you are a school administrator or an LEA user. We're going to review that process later, but just know if you have a teacher account or a proctor account, that is going to be a level of functionality that you do not have access to. Anyone administering summative tests, though, should read and familiarize themselves with the appropriate sections of the TAM which apply to their user role. So especially because reading the TAM scripts verbatim is required for the summative assessments, uh, the TAM is designed to allow for printing by specific user role as well, okay? So teachers or proctors, you don't need to print the whole thing. You can just print the specific sections that uh, kind of outline your user role responsibilities. The reporting guide helps give direction for interpreting scores, setting up your reports, as well as how to print ISRs when the time comes, because parents need to be notified of their students' scores within three weeks of test completion. That's a really important piece. Let's not forget that. Again, parents should be notified of their students' scores within three weeks of test completion, okay? So now that we've kind of covered those resources, we're going to skip down to TIDE. When you first select the TIDE option, you are going to be prompted to log in with your credentials. And once you've done that, the landing page looks like this. The TIDE homepage reflects the stages of test, the testing process from start to finish. So you've got preparing, administering, and after. Note that the after testing blue section is for LEA level users only. So if you're a teacher or a testing coordinator, you're only going to see the first orange and green sections. 
uh, the appeals requests as well. We're going to look more closely at those. But if you have a number other than zero in that little red circle, you have some appeals to review. So make sure you're watching for those. The Tide homepage also houses the waffle menu for navigating to other areas, as well as the secure file center. This replaced the secure inbox er um, earlier this school year. Permissions for accessing data and viewing other information in Tide is definitely determined by your user roles. With RISE, there are six different roles, okay? And those six roles have very different permissions associated with them. So most of you in this training should have the LEA administrator role. That doesn't apply for all, but most of you will have that, especially if you are your assessment director or work in your district office. This screenshot from the Tide User Guide gives you an idea of how those permissions break down. So you can see those user abbreviations across the top of the table in the blue. For example, an LEA administrator can perform tasks that are not available to a teacher level user. You can see here that LEA and school administrators are granted more permissions than our teachers and proctors. These permissions also limit the scope of data access. So a district level user can work with data pertaining to that district, school, individual teachers within their district, while a school level user is only going to be able to work with data pertaining to their individual school and or their assigned specific rosters. When you need to access any secure documentation or student data files that you've previously exported from Tide or from RISE reporting, that's what's going to show up in your secure file center button in that banner. Okay, From there, you can download or archive or delete any of your previously exported files. And then now we're going to look at each of these sections under preparing for testing individually. So we're going to start with this orange section. Here, you're going to be able to view and edit user accounts, as well as add new users. The students drop down is going to allow you to access and edit student accounts, like adding accommodations. Um, so now in an effort to not have to travel backward through the slides, this is kind of an all call for how to set accommodations for students within the RISE system. So if you're multitasking, tune in now, accommodations, I'm teaching you how to do it, okay? The student dropdown is also where you'll, uh, you can upload student settings and create a frequency distribution report, which we're going to go over a bit later. But know that the frequency distribution report will allow you to filter by grade, things like gender, scribe, color choice, assistive technology, those types of things. Okay. Incidentally, whenever you're accessing student information, again, those results can be exported to your secure file center that we touched on earlier that's on the Tide homepage. This really just allows for larger result tables, and they can also be exported as an Excel file or a C CSV file, and it keeps them secure, okay? This is a demo student record and gives you an idea of what an individual student record might look like. The student information used to search is displayed up at the top, while the student participation is displayed on the bottom. You can view individual settings, including the accommodations, by clicking the edit pencil icon that's there on the left. Clicking that icon allows you to see assessments, benchmark modules, anything the students already participated in. Um, if there's a parental exclusion associated with the student, it will also allow you to view and set the student's test settings. This includes the Spanish adaptive option, okay, for the summative tests. To set the accommodations for students who need them, you need to click on this little pencil icon and that's going to take you to the student testing set, test setting screen. And I know it's small print, but once you click on that pencil icon, you'll note there are separate menus which will expand or condense based on the little plus minus buttons on the left. If you look at the very top, there are student information and student participation menus which have not been expanded. I've chosen to expand the visual assistance tools, presentation, um, integration with assistive technology and other accommodations menus. So you can see that this is where you can set those. To do so, you use the series of drop down menus and those toggle switches to make any changes to any assistance tools or presentation modifications like Braille, ASL, print on request, um, anything that would be an accommodation outlined in an IEP or a 504 document. Okay, accommodations are not uploaded through the Scrammer Utrecht sync. 
Okay, they're taken care of manually through this section. This is also where you can set the Spanish adaptive feature for the summative assessment for students who uh, may require that. New for this spring 2024 administration, CAI has implemented a new export option that pulls the current test tool settings for your selected students and exports those into an Excel sheet that is pre-formatted to import back into Tide. So this Excel spreadsheet is going to allow for quicker edits by allowing users to re-upload when changing student test settings, and it's accessed from the View, Edit, Export, Student Tide uh, task thing there in Tide. Um, just note that this new export feature is not in any way going to take place of the Tide forms that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, users are only able to upload changes to student test settings that are already editable in Tide um, that we looked at on that previous slide. Users cannot they can't successfully upload test settings for accommodations or test settings that require state approval um, without like the tied forms being filled out. Okay, those would if somebody tried to those test settings are just going to be rejected during the uploads validation step. So make sure that if you choose to use this option, it's only for the ones that would be set in tied originally. Anything that would be required for the state approvals or for the forms, you're still going to follow um, the process that was uh, put in place last year. Um, as I mentioned before, this is also where you'll be able to apply the Spanish adaptive version of the test. To apply Spanish adaptive feature, you are going to select Spanish under math and or science under those two test families, and then you just click save. As a reminder, it is not available for the ELA assessment. Um, this isn't going to show up in Tide, but I wanted to bring attention to it since we were talking about it, because this is what it's going to look like for students in the testing environment. As a reminder, we have developed recommendations for students who we feel would benefit most from the Spanish adaptive version of the summative assessment. It's important to note that the decision really ultimately needs to be determined by the LEA's language services team with support of the parent and student preference. Okay. More guidance surrounding this is provided in the TAM starting on page 38. So back to our menu, uh, the student menu is also where you can create that frequency distribution report that I mentioned earlier. This report is available at the LEA or school level. It will show you the number of students in a specific category. Okay. Uh, again, once you generate one of these reports, it's going to be sent to that um, it's not called the secure inbox anymore, the secure file center, okay? These results can be displayed in like a grid or a graph or a combination of the two. If you have students who require the use of assistive technology or scribe, you need to make that request to USBE through TIDE using the forms functionality. This will alert USBE and require, it requires approval, okay? So to do that, you will Click the Submit Forms option from the Forms drop-down menu. On the next page, you're going to select the type of form you wish to submit. Um, you can select Request Form as applicable to the accommodation being requested. For assistive technology requests, you need to complete the form detailing all of the demographic information of the school, um, detail the requirements of the accommodation. All of the sections on this form need to be completed. Once you've completed the form, you need to agree that the accommodation is documented. It's used regularly and with fidelity in your classroom instruction, and it's been attempted in training tests to ensure it functions as expected for the student. Upon submission, a tracking identifier is going to be provided, and it's recommended that you save this identifier to easily track the status of your accommodation request. Okay. Um, please note here, though, once you've submitted that request, it can't be edited or changed. This request will then be reviewed by USBE, and upon approval, the staff will enable those requested accommodations in TIDE. If you have any questions uh, regarding this process, you can reach out directly to Jessica Wilhelm, our special education specialist. Okay. And, oh, I can see she Jessica just put in the chat. I missed an L in her last name. So make sure you get it from the chat. It is also, I believe, on the last slide. Spelled correctly. Thank you, Jessica. I will fix it <laughs> in my slides here, too, before they go out to you. Once you submit those requests, you can review them. Okay. 
On the TIDE dashboard, click on Forms in the Preparing for Testing grouping, and then click on View or Edit. On the next page, the Viewer Edit Forms search box is displayed. Any fields denoted with that little asterisk are required. So you'll just select and input any of the relevant search settings based on your previously submitted accommodation form and click Search. The status of the forms matching the selected search criteria will then be displayed on your screen. Um, this is optional, but if you want to view further details about the request, you just need to click on the little pencil icon to the left of the applicable form. So now we're going to look at rosters. The rosters tab allows you to search pre-existing rosters. You can create, edit, or delete user-defined rosters, and you can view all of the system-defined rosters. So again, we kind of touched on this already, but why would someone want a user-defined roster? This is for if teachers are working with students receiving maybe special ed services, that that teacher might want to create a roster with those students who may be on a system-defined roster with another teacher. Again, it's going to be really helpful in co-teaching situations as well. Remember that system-defined rosters cannot be edited. They're just loaded through our Utrecht sync. Um, if you're experiencing rostering issues, please reach out to our data specialist over Utrecht, Maureen Rushing. Just remember, it's important to ensure um, teachers who are testing have correct students on their rosters prior to the actual test so that if teachers elect to print testing tickets, they have accurate information, okay? Um, participation codes is the next section under preparing for testing. Participation codes are used by USBE for summative assessments. The only exception to this is the parental exclusion participation code, which is actually entered for any assessment, not just summative assessments. To update a student's participation codes, you just search for students using the available filters. The search results table displays those students who match the search you entered, and then the participation codes column lists any assigned participation codes. If you need to add a code, you'll select the little edit pencil for the student whose participation code you want to update. And then the edit non-participation code page is going to appear. You'll see that student information at the top, and then you can edit the codes using the drop-down menus available for each of the tests that the student is eligible to take. And you can update those as needed. So as a note here, if a student doesn't appear on a roster, you'll want to check here for a parental exclusion status for that student, okay? Because having that code applied is going to, like, it removes them, it hides them. That might be a better term for it. It hides them from appearing on a roster because they're not eligible to take the test due to that parental exclusion code. Do we have questions about any of the resources we've talked about so far, like the TAM, the user guide, reporting guide we'll also talk about a little bit later, but if you have questions, you're welcome to ask any rostering or accommodations questions or participation codes. There's a comment in the chat, Elise, that says there was a number when I first got in that I needed to save for my records, but you switched the slides right before I could get it. And I'm not sure what oh, number I'm it was. You said either. that you needed to save in the records because there aren't actually any numbers that I'm aware of that we need to save. No. The only thing I can think of is like a test session ID, but we haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> Elise, Elise, you can you type a little bit more in the chat? I think it was an example of when submitting a request. Oh, is that for accommodations? Are you talking about the accommodations request for, for Scribe? It was a couple oh, slides yeah. back. Let's see. It's got to be. Asking for a code. This is accommodations. Aline, if it comes to you with more detail, just let me know and we're happy to clarify.
Oh, thanks, Derek. The slide with Jessica's email. Let's go back. Sorry, are you getting dizzy? <laughs> this one. The request will be reviewed. Oh, um, the save the number for your records. It's just going to show up on your screen, Aline, when you submit one. So this is just an example. It's not a specific number you have to remember specifically. It's just the number that if you were to submit, you're going to see that and it would be on your screen to be able to save, if that makes more sense. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because these are just screenshots of examples. Um, any other questions for accommodations, participation codes, rostering? Hey, if something comes up again, please drop it in the chat. We have people monitoring it while I am speaking. Um, so if they can address it at that um, at that point, and if not, they'll they'll interject. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of your checklist. Um, before you conduct any testing, I recommend going through this checklist just to ensure that all of your bases are covered. Um, if you have any questions regarding our standard test administration and testing ethics policy, please reach out to Kim Rathke, our testing and data coordinator. She's the one monitoring our chat today. Um, I would also recommend reviewing the TAM. Make sure you have your scripts ready to read. Ensure that devices that students are going to be using are able to support um, RISE testing. They're in working order. This includes keyboards, computer mice, headphones. Make sure students take a training test at some point before so that they are familiar with the system. Check your rosters, print your testing tickets. Make sure students who require accommodations have the appropriate settings applied. Um, I would also mention here, take into account um, the classroom or the location environment. Make sure that you're eliminating distracting noises. Um, as a note here, do not play music during standardized assessments. Cover or remove any materials that are going to provide hints or answers to students. If possible, you may even want to find a way to arrange your room in such a way that it prevents students from viewing each other's computer screens. Um, you'll need to notify students also of your local electronic device policy prior to administration because no devices should be allowed during testing. Electronic devices include, not limited to, but include cell phones, smartphones, smartwatches, any, any internet capable device. Um, the only exception to this is students who may be using a device to monitor health situations like diabetes. Um, if you have special questions regarding students who require that specific accommodation, you can also reach out to Jessica um, with, those, with those questions as well. If you have elected to Elise, use... Elise, you may, you may want to uh, mention the embedded scripting this year. That's a little bit different for some people who've given rice tests in the back in the past about the embedded that the student, they don't have to, as much to read this year because the students are going to have to listen to it. Yes, there is lots of embedded scripting with far less included in, um, in the TAM itself. Um, Eric, can I put you on the spot to provide more specific detailing of what they might or might see that's different? Sure. So um, as your students are logging into um, the test, um, new this spring is going to be um, text that will be read aloud to the students. Um, so what's in the TAM right now, um, there's the instructions you'll read to your students that say, um, you know, you're about to take blank test um, and some like details about the test and here's what you need to do for each step. Um, those actually will start to be automated this spring um, for uh, your students. So you would actually, this, the TAM scripts are going to be shortened um, because the computer will automatically read them out loud. Um, so I, I think the main thing there is just make sure all your students have headphones because they will all the tests will be reading it out loud. So, um, but yeah, that will be coming. I'm sorry, in the spring. Thank you. If you have elected to use testing tickets, there are a couple of different places that you can access them. You can print tickets from the students menu as well as the rosters menu um, in the preparing for test section. However, the print test tics, tickets option that's here in green is really the easiest place because it's just kind of like a one-stop shop. So if you're selecting to do it from this location, after you select the print test tickets dropdown, you'll select the print from roster list where you'll be prompted to use the drop-down menus for roster type, the teacher name, 
and it's then going to create that list for you. From there, you'll be able to select the sections that you want to print tickets for. The printer icon will illuminate and become available once you've selected a couple of these um, check boxes, whether you're selecting one or all of them. Okay, these can be printed one roster name at a time, again, or you can select all. And then that little printer icon, which appears great on the screen right now, it will illuminate once at least one roster has been selected for printing. So now that we've prepped for testing, we're going to move on to monitoring testing progress. There are two different views to be aware of with the administering test menu section, one for admins and then one for teachers. You'll notice the admins have more options as well as the option to make test appeal requests. We're going to go over that later. Um, but the other added components to the admin level view include the test session status report and the test status code report. You'll want to actively monitor testing through all testing windows. Um, so the tasks available in the monitoring test progress task menu are going to allow you to generate various reports that provide information about a test administration's progress. The following reports are available in TIDE. You've got the plan and manage testing report. This details a student's test opportunities and the status of those test opportunities. So you can generate this report from the plan and manage testing page or the participation report by SSID page. There's also the test completion rates report. We're going to look at this one separately here in a minute. And then there's the test status code report, which displays all of the participation codes for a test administration. So you can create your own plan and manage testing report with your own specific search criteria. This allows teachers, administrators, LEA level users, anyone using the system to generate customizable participation reports, which will show student progress. You'll need to fill out your LEA school information specific to your search, and then you can search for individual students. Or the drop downs under Get Specific allow you to drill down to very specific components. By zooming in a bit here, you can see it provides you with the option to select by have or have not, completed, not completed, paused, um, checking close to expired, you can search by SSID, by session ID, as well as within a specific date range. Um, another participation report is the test completion rate report. It summarizes the number and percentage of students who have started or completed a test. These items are all columns which appear in this report. The test, LEA information, students, how many have started, how many have completed, so on. Um, so now we're going to move into the actual test administration. Um, as a reminder, the TAM is located in the resources section. Um, but to open a testing session, you'll actually need to select the test administration system option on the left hand side. These are the same six steps for any RISE test benchmark module, interim assessment, sum of assessment. If teachers have administered benchmark modules or interims, this is not going to look different. Um, two proctors are best for test security. They don't need to be certified teachers, but they do need to have gone through the appropriate testing ethics training. Um, for students testing in person, one proctor might be in the room with students while the other is roaming amongst all testing areas within your building. However, for students testing remotely, those two proctors need to be in the same physical location for ease of communication, okay? Um, be sure to have any testing materials like your testing tickets, headphones, scripting, scratch paper, all of those things ready to go because it's just going to provide the least amount of dis disruption during the actual administration. Okay. So now we're going to look step by step through the administration process. Um, the first step in administering any test is to create the testing session. So this should be done a fewer than 20 minutes prior to starting the test in order to prevent the system from timing out. Um, the list of students in the session will generate automatically once the students log in. When you first log in to the test administration interface and select a test type, um, the test selection window will automatically appear and you can then create your test sessions. And in our continued efforts to prevent misadministrations of summative assessments, this 
big fat important box will appear. It says you are about to select a summative test. Students have only one opportunity to take this test. Click OK to continue. If you really want to administer this, please type summative. I love this box because so far, um, well, we we experienced quite the uptake in ministrations, misadministrations last year. And to my knowledge, we've had exactly zero misadministrations of summative assessment so far, which is a gigantic improvement. So we're loving this box, which is a new feature for us. When you first log in again, you're going to select that test type. All of the assessments in the test selection window are color coded. The summative ones are blue. Okay. The available tests are going to be organized into categories, just like the ones shown on your screen. You can click the plus sign button next to a category name to view the tests in that category to kind of more accurately open a test session for a specific grade or specific subject area. To create the test session, um, you just click one or more of those tests, click the checkbox, and those tests are going to populate in the tests selected box on the right. If you miss select anything, um, you can see that you can clear all with the garbage can, or you can just click the gray X next to those individual tests, tests to remove them. Um, students are only going to have access to the tests that you include in the list and the ones that they are eligible to take. Once you've got that all filled out, you'll notice there's a session type. There is in-person. There's also a radial button for the remote or hybrid. If you are one of our schools participating in remote administration because your students receive 100% of their instruction online, make sure that you click that remote or hybrid option. Okay, that's what's going to trigger the communication pieces within the system so that the students and teachers can communicate back and forth. Once all of this is set, you just click Start Rise Live Test Session. And when you click that, the system is going to automatically generate a session ID. That ID is going to appear at the top of the interface along with a stop button. That ID needs to be provided to students for them to log in. Lots of teachers elect to write it on their board. Um, some choose to provide it using a printed card or putting it on their testing ticket. Okay, If you do provide students with the information on paper, please be sure to collect it and destroy it when the session is complete. You should also note uh, the session ID just for your own records here. For example, if you accidentally close your browser, entering the session ID will allow you to resume the session. Okay, If you don't have this information when you try to resume, you'll be unable to do so and you'd have to start a new one. When students start signing in to the test session, an approvals button is also going to appear next to this just that session ID. Once you approve students for testing, the test session tab will appear and uh, in that center area of the interface, and it's going to display your students' testing progress. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit. Um, we're going to look now at the TDS banner in its entirety. In the banner at the top of this, you're going to see a set of buttons and your username. The student lookup tab is a search for students' login information, and it's also a way that you can verify that your students' login credentials are correct. You can click the approve requests to view a list of students. Um, you can also review your print requests in that section. You can click print session if you want to print a screenshot of this screen. Um, the help guide link in that upper right allows you to access additional information about the test administration interface. And then you can click the log out button under your account to exit this interface. Um, the approval spot is really the most important piece to be aware of. If you notice, there's a little red one next to it. Okay, that tells me that I have one student waiting for approval. And you just want to watch that number increase as students get logged into the secure browser. Okay, just know they can't access any test question until you hit that approval button. This is also especially important to remember with the math six test because there are two um, two segments and you'll have to reapprove students when they go to open that second segment. So if a student's having trouble logging in, logging in, you can use that student lookup feature to verify that the student's login credentials are correct. You can use either the quick search or the advanced search option to view the information entered for the student in the uh, test administration distribution engine tied section. Okay, With quick search, you're going to just simply enter the student's SSID and click submit SSID. 
Advanced allows you to narrow it using several filters, like a district, school, first name, last name. Anytime you use either one of these, the search results, um, anytime there's going to be that list of results, those matches are going to appear at the bottom of the window. If there's no match, you're going to see an error message. So if you see the student you're looking for, you can click the little I button, that little I icon next to the student name. The screen will then display the student's information. Um, note that the information displayed is going to vary slightly from here. This is just a demo account, but you get the gist of what you're going to be able to see if you're looking for it. Um, if there's no issues to take care of, you could begin approving students for entry right away. It's just important that you pay close attention to the test name prior to approval, just to be sure that students have selected the appropriate test. Okay. To approve students for testing, you can click the green check boxes one at a time, or you can do the approve all option that's at the top. You can ensure the Spanish setting as well as all of your other accommodations by clicking the I by an individual student and just scrolling to the presentation tab. Okay. That's where you can convert, confirm language selection, again, as well as any other accommodation that um, should be on the student's test settings. Um, even though you can approve all students at the same time, students need to be individually denied entry to the test session. So you might be asking, why would I deny a student to a test session? That would be if the student's not supposed to enter that specific session, if the student's uh, demographic information is incorrect, if the student's required accommodations are incorrect, those would be all reasons that you would want to do that little X instead of the check bar. If you deny a student entry to the test, it is not going to prevent other students from beginning their tests. Okay. If the student's test settings are incorrect, the settings will need to be updated in TIDE before the student can take the test. So you'd need to contact your school testing coordinator or your district testing coordinator, depending on what the accommodation is to have those settings updated. Okay. Um, yeah, no, at, least, I, at least this is one of the reasons why we you need two proctors, because this way all the other students can still continue to test. And when the roving proctor stops by, you can say, I have got a student or this is how you practice your communication plan for how you are doing your proctoring. Um, and this, these are the kind of things that a lot of people think they've got handled. And then they start to test and they go, oops, we've got a problem. And that's what the second proctor generally does most of the time. Another thing I want to hit on that uh, Kim's comments reminded me of, this is uh, checking these beforehand is also going to prevent you possibly having to create test appeals or reset the test for the student later. If you can verify these things to begin with and make sure that the student's not accessing the test without the appropriate accommodations or settings, you, it, it just saves you a lot of issues later. <laughs> um, also, Note that this, those test settings, they, um, they, they can be changed while the student is actively testing. However, you have to log back out, change the things, and the student has to log back in. Okay? And those updates are only going to take effect after the student logs out and then logs back in. Okay? So they could have started, but it's really just better practice to make sure that everything is ready to go um, before they get logged in. Once students logged in they, and they're approved, test administration teachers are going to monitor their status from a table here that shows up on their screen. Okay, The table shows student information, the test name, the opportunity number, progress, test status, the settings, as well as an actions option. The progress column displays the student's progress through the items in the test. So it may display a progress bar to indicate that the student's progressing through the test, or it could display the total number of items completed thus far, okay? The test settings column is going to display either standard or custom. This column will display custom when a student's test settings are different from the default of the test, okay? If you wanna verify those again, you just click the little I. And then the actions column, allows you to pause a student's test. Um, if at any time TDS detects that a student might be having technical issues or if they require assistance, a tests with potential issues table is going to appear above the tests without issue table. OK, 
Okay, a more info icon will appear and you can hover over that icon and it will display more information about what issue might be occurring. If a student requests a printout, a printer icon will appear in the actions column. The printout request feature is available only for students who require it per their IEP or 504 plan. Please contact your school test coordinator if your student needs this accommodation. Or if you have questions regarding this accommodation, again, reach out to Jessica. Okay, It's a testing impropriety to apply this restricted resource for a student who does not have an IEP or, an, or a 504 plan. Okay, Students with this accommodation can request printouts of stimuli, items. It just kind of depends on their settings. All right. When a student sends a print request, the printer button is going to appear in the actions column. You just click that button to view the request. If you click the check button to approve the request, a cover sheet containing the student's name and SSID will display in a new browser window. Okay, no test content is ever going to display on your screen. Just click print in the new window to complete that print request and the printer dialog box will display. You can then click OK to send the request to the printer. If you click the X button to deny the print request, nothing's going to print. So before approving the student's print request, just ensure that it will be sent to a printer that is monitored by staff who have been trained in test security, okay? Because all printed test items, stimuli, reading passages, all of those things need to be securely stored and destroyed immediately following the test session. Back to our Approve Requests button, this allows you to view a list of every print request that you've approved during the current session. So if you wish to print this list for your own records, you can do that with um, the print button as well. If you wish to print a snapshot of your screen in its current view, you can click the Print Session button. This can be useful for tracking when students don't complete their tests and might need to be scheduled for another session. Um, it might be necessary to set the page layout, though, to landscape or possibly adjust your margins in your print preview screen just in order for the list to fit on the page. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, and remember that any printouts containing any personally identifiable student information need to be securely stored during testing and then destroyed after use. You have two options within the testing interface to pause or stop testing once it's begun. You can pause an individual student's test or you can stop the entire session. To pause an individual student's test, you just click the pause button in the actions column, okay? When prompted, you just click OK to confirm that you want to pause the test. Um, this option would be appropriate if a student falls ill, for example. In the event of an emergency that requires all students to stop testing, though, instead of pausing all of those students' tests one at a time, just click your stop session as that's going to immediately pause the student's tests, if, like I said, in the event of an emergency. Um, because if you stop the session, any in-progress test is going to be paused. Um, if the session stops, it cannot be resumed, okay? But you can just create a new test session and give a new student, I not student ID, a new session ID to the students so they can resume testing when it becomes more appropriate, okay? Um, in the event you need to stop the entire test session for all students, again, just click the stop button next to the session ID. Um, also, if you forget to log out before leaving the testing area, the session's going to close automatically after 20 minutes of in inactivity on both the teacher computers and the student computers, okay? You would then need to create a new session if that occurred as well to, uh, for students to be able to resume testing. Um, in the event you need to transfer the monitoring and management of your session, you can transfer an active test session from one device to another device without stopping the session or even interrupting any in-progress tests. This is useful in scenarios when your computer malfunctions, um, if a laptop battery is dying, um, if you accidentally close a browser while a session is in progress, or maybe you're proctoring in a remote session and need the other proctor to take over with another device, okay? Please note that to transfer a test session, you need to enter the active session ID. So your session remains open until it's timed out. So the only way it would time out is if you didn't return to that session within 20 minutes and there's no student activity, okay? Other than that, as long as it's passed on, 
you're good to go and it's not going to put um, student tests um, in a paused in a paused fashion. So to do this, again, you don't want to log out because if you do, it's going to end the session and pause all student tests. While the session is still active on the original device or browser, you're going to sign in to the test administration site on a different device okay, or a new browser. The session ID prompt will appear and you're just going to enter that active the active session ID into the text box, click enter, and that's going to then allow you to continue monitoring student progress from the new device rather than the one that it was first on. Okay, the, ses the test session on that previous computer is going to automatically close. It's not going to stop the session or pause student tests, but it's just a way that you can pass the session from one to another if it's needed at any time. Um, Upon completion of a session, you'll click the logout button in the upper right corner of the page. It's preferred for you to log out only after stopping your active test session as logging out is going to cause all in-progress in tests to be paused. Okay, a confirmation message is going to appear asking you to confirm that you want to exit the website and pause all students' in-progress tests. Um, this scenario also occurs when you navigate to another website from the interface. Okay. However, regardless of when or how you log out of or navigate away from the, the um, test administrator interface, it's not going to interrupt student data. It's not going to be lost. Okay. If you need to access another site during a testing session, we encourage you to open it in a separate browser window. All right. This table presents some of the common issues that you or your students may encounter during a test session. Okay, it talks about what you do if a test session ends or if they are logged out of a test while the session is still active. Okay, what to do if there are forbidden applications running, which wouldn't happen because the secure browser doesn't allow it. Okay, what to do if a student's test freezes for that one, force quit the browser, just log back in. There's also instructions for all of these in the test administration manual. So now we're going to look at the secure browser student interface. So this is what students will see when they're logging in. You'll notice the first name, SSID, and session ID are all required for sign-in. Students need to use the secure browser to log in. Okay, the secure browser is designed to ensure testing security. It prohibits students from accessing any programs or websites during testing. Okay, it kind of locks it all down there. Your school's testing coordinator is responsible for ensuring that the secure browser has been installed on all testing devices. So if you have questions about installation, contact your uh, technology coordinator. To log into the online testing system, again, students are going to use the browser. They're going to be on a separate device from the one that the teacher is using. And when all of these entries are complete, the student's going to click the sign in button to log in. Teachers can definitely assist with students logging in if necessary. Um, if students are having difficulty logging in, an error message and a code is going to display on the login screen. The most common errors occur when students' um, first name and SSID either don't match what's in the system or when an SSID is entered incorrectly. Okay. Um, if the student receives an error message indicating that he or she has entered incorrect information in the first name or SSID fields, um, the teacher might want to use the student lookup tool that's on the teacher interface just to verify that information. Um, another common error that occurs when a student enters information is the incorrect session ID. So if a student receives the message, the session is not available, you just want to verify that the session ID was entered correctly, that there's no extra spaces or extra characters. Okay. If a student receives an error message that says the session has expired, you'll want to ensure that the student has entered the correct session ID for the current session. Because if the student has entered the uh, session ID correctly, the teacher interface is just going to verify that the session is still open. After logging in, students need to complete just a few more steps before they begin testing. The students are going to be asked to view and verify their personal information. If the information is correct, they should click yes and proceed. If it's incorrect, they definitely should click no and return to the login page. You would then want to contact your school or district testing coordinator just to have 
uh, the student's information updated in Tide before the student attempts to log in again. This is important to pay attention to because some students have the same first and last names. The grade and the SSID need to match, okay? We want to make sure that students are taking the correct test and for the correct student. On the Your Test screen, students are then going to see a list of their assigned tests for that test session. If the tests displayed are incorrect or they expect um, to see a test that's not there, the student should then click the Back to Login button and return to the login page and just talk with their test administrator or teacher to resolve that issue. If there are no errors here, the student should select the correct test, and then they're just waiting for approval to proceed, okay? As a note here, this screenshot is for training test, so just know that it will look a little bit different for a summative test. After the teacher has approved students for a testing session, students will see a screen titled Choose Settings. This screen shows the name of the test and the selected accessibility resources. If the information is correct, the student should, should then click that select button from the bottom. If any of the information is incorrect, they can go back and wait for help from their teacher. The teacher will need to read any required scripting, but again, this is changing dramatically um, as much of it has become able to be embedded within the system. So make sure you're checking the TAM and um, any updates that come. After verifying their test, students are going to then proceed through a series of functionality checks to make sure that the testing device is functioning properly. This um, is going to test audio, video, um, then they just click continue at the bottom. These checks are great because they also allow for headphones to be tested before getting into the test itself. So be sure to push that cord in all the way so it, um, so it doesn't wiggle out. Okay. Next, students will review information about the tools, navigation features that they have access to. Um, the test settings section allows students to view all of their current test settings. The additional test information section lists any additional information that's necessary for students to know while in the session. The help guide section contains an overview of the test site, the rules, and information on text-to-speech, print-on-request features, things like that. And then when the student clicks begin test now, they will be presented with that first question on the test. Um, before we look at the test interface itself and what those um, tools are, I want to draw your attention to the global tools um, and some other features that are available for all students to use during testing. Um, we'll look at these tools and features in detail on following slides, um, but know that the global tools are available for all students. The assistive technology ones require state approval. Again, any questions for these, you can direct to Jessica Wilhelm. Her email is correct on this slide, <laughs> if you needed to note it. And there's also a link there for the assistive technology manual. So um, the other thing I want to talk about today is remote proctoring. You are going to be scheduling your sessions if you are participating in remote proctoring. Okay, to do this, step one is going to look a little bit different because teachers are going to be prompted to set a start and end date for when the test is going to be available prior to selecting their test and their session type. All of the other steps are going to remain the same. So if the session's a remote session, a pop-up window is going to appear in your web browser requesting access to your microphone and camera. Okay, users will need to select allow um, if you don't select allow, students taking the test are going to be unable to see you or hear you during your any video conferencing that might need to occur. So after you've put in the date range, you select the test, the subject and grade, the session name, the type, hit save. Again, pay attention to that little blue radial because you need to move it from in-person to remote before you hit save. The session information pop-up window is then going to appear. This pop-up window provides the session ID that teachers need to share with students so the students can join the session when it starts. Um, note that guidance for securely communicating this with students is included in the section um, in the TAM. I believe it's titled How to Communicate Session Information Securely. Teachers also should copy this session ID and link for themselves, save it in a secure location in case they need it later. Um, after you provide the session ID to students, 
you can um, click the little close there, the little X button, and then the test administration site appears again. And it's going to display all of your upcoming sessions. The scheduled session will appear in that table. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about how you can communicate the session information securely to your students who are going to be testing remotely. This information should not be shared over an unsecure communication method, like a personal email or a text message. Um, instead, your teachers need to communicate this to students using a secure method, such as a classroom management system that they're already using for instructional purposes. Um, encrypted emails would also be appropriate as long as students are familiar with how to access the information once it's been encrypted, okay? Um, this is one of the reasons you'll want to conduct training tests in that secure setting in that remote format prior to your summative administration because you want your teachers and your students to be very familiar with the communication process before, during, and after your testing. Um, if a teacher needs to, they can modify these sessions that are scheduled um, that haven't started yet. For example, a teacher might want to modify a session after it was created to change the start and end date. Um, to do this, they just need to access it through the test administration site, and then the options for editing or deleting the session are there available with the little pencil or the little garbage can. For students signing in on their devices in a remote setting with the secure browser, they're going to, again, use the same login interface appearance that in-person students would. They're going to log in with their first name, their SSID, and the session ID that was provided to them in the secure setting, okay? This will verify their personal information, and they need to select the required test, and at this point, they would be sitting and waiting for approval from their teacher, okay? Once they're approved, they'll complete the same series of audio visual checks that they would if they were in person. This is where it gets a little different because once a remote session is started and students have joined, teachers can communicate with all students using the broadcast feature. So the teacher can type a message and they can then select the send icon, which will automatically appear on the testing device of each student that's been logged into the session. And because we all know that students really love to use a text and chat feature, it might be helpful to remind students that they don't need to individually reply to broadcast messages unless you've requested them to do so. Because students can respond to the messages from the teacher just by typing a message into the chat box, okay? This is another reason why your remote sessions are limited to 10 students or less, because there is a chance, a very real possibility, that you could have up to 10 chat boxes open on your screen. Okay, when a student sends a message, a message waiting icon is going to appear under their image on the test administration site, and the teacher just selects the student's image to view it. Okay, as with most applications, once you select the little X in the corner, it's going to close that window down for you. Um, while students are testing off-site, teachers can observe video of students all at once in low resolution, or they can select one student at a time to view at high resolution. So to view a high resolution of the student, you just select the student video icon for the student that you wish to view. If needed, at that point, you can also start a one-on-one -on -one video conference. During that video conference, teachers can see and hear the student, and if the teacher allows, the student can see and hear the teacher. They can do this just by selecting the student video icon for the student that they want to speak with. That conference pop-up is going to open it's going to display that high resolution video of the student that we just looked at. But you can, again, take that one step further by selecting the call icon at the bottom to be able to speak with the student. Once that call is initiated on the teacher device, a pop-up display screen is going to show up in a split screen. So you've got the teacher and the student viewable. On the student device, the video conference pop-up window displays automatically. So it's gonna display this very same split screen view of you and your student. And then teachers can toggle their webcams and or their microphones on and off using the buttons displayed at the top of the pop-up window. Teachers also will uh, disconnect the call using the button at the bottom, just like you'd see on your phone. 
Uh, students who require assistance at any time can request it from their teacher with a virtual hand raise um, while they're taking that remote assessment. When they do this, they will appear at the top of the class list. This makes it a lot easier to monitor with your Proctor dashboard. Uh, the teacher can respond to the student request for assistance by either initiating that chat or video like we just went over. When you select the student, um, again, you can chat with them using the message options or you can call them. Okay? You can also lower the student's hand once the communication is complete so that they disappear from your tests with potential issues list. If a student's question requires a teacher to be able to view the student's screen, there is screen sharing functionality. Um, the teacher will need to select the view icon and the student is prompted to give permission for the teacher to view their screen. Once the student specifies which screen they want to share, a red dashed border is going to appear around that student's screen. And the teacher will then be able to view the student's screen. So there's two ways once you're in this functionality to end it. The student can either select stop sharing or the teacher can select the end icon on the video conferencing. Just like in an in-person session, test alerts appear on the list of students if the RISE testing system has not detected any activity from the student for a while. Um, this might happen if the student's computer has gone to sleep or if the student is experiencing some sort of interruption. So in the event of a test alert, all student responses are saved, so there's no concern that students are going to lose their testing data. But students with those test alerts are automatically moved to the tests with potential issues list at the top of the page. Okay, As a teacher or a proctor, you can respond to these in a myriad of ways. You can either select the student video um, just to see what might be going on in the testing environment. Um, from there, the teacher can send the student a chat. They can initiate that one-on-one -on -one video uh, just to be able to communicate with the student to see what might be going on. Um, for these remote proctoring, um, so students needing to take remote summative, there is a new online student field in the student settings. So all users are going to be able to see this, but only users with a school administrator or an LEA user are going to be able to edit it. Okay, This needs to be set per student as appropriate based on the remote testing policies that USBE has set. Okay. If it's set to yes, the student is going to receive the remote testing tools. If it's unset or set to no, the student is going to receive the standard in-person test administration. So now we're going to look at those global tools that are available for all users, Okay, not just remote users. This is for everyone. You'll notice there are arrows in the top left which are there for students to use when advancing back and forth between questions. And the other available tools appear in the upper right with some in that collapsible hamburger style menu on the um, question or cluster itself. The notepad appears in the item specific hamburger dropdown. Students can use the notepad to make notes about an item, um, but note that those notepad items are item specific. So students can only access their notes for a question when they're on that question on the test page, okay? Notes will continue to be saved though. So when a student moves to like the next question, but then moves, if they chose to move back, the notes would still appear there, okay? Um, the notes tool, however, is not item specific. Anything the student types in this section is available to them throughout the entirety of the test. These notes are saved. They continue to be accessible for later segments, even in a segmented test, okay? The notes will also be retained if the student logs out and it's resumed later. To use the highlighter tool that's available, you can either select the desired text and right click and select highlighter selection, or you can find it in that item specific hamburger dropdown menu with the stimulus. To remove highlighting, the student will need to right click in the area of the highlighted text and they can then select reset highlighting. Um, if the student pauses the test, any highlighting made before pausing is going to be retained. 
Students can also use the strike through tool to help them visually eliminate answers that they believe are incorrect or that they wish to ignore. To do this, they right click on the text of the answer they want to mark and then click strike through. The answer text will then display with a line through it. To remove the strike through, they right click and click undo strike through that would pop up. Um, it is important to note here that striking through answers does not indicate a response to a question. The student still needs to select the answer that they wish to select. Okay. Also, on that note, applying the strike through tool doesn't prevent the student from selecting that marked answer as a response. Okay. They can still select it if they've opted to use the strike through. So just kind of know um, that nuance of the functionality. Um, another element of the test, which is helpful for students, is the mark for review feature. So as students go through the test, they're required to answer each question on the screen before they can go on. So they need to be able to provide what they believe is the best answer. But if they're unsure and want to be able to come back to it at some point, they can mark that item or items with the little flag to review those before they submit. Okay. To mark an item for review, you just use the hamburger drop-down menu from the item and select Mark for Review. Um, the item number is then going to display with a little doggy ear corner and a little small flag. For those items with tabs, items marked for review are going to, again, display with that little dog ear. Um, at any time during a test segment, the student can then go back to those marked items and review and change their answers as needed. Okay. Uh, to unmark an item, the student just can select from the very same drop down and select the unmark review item. But note that once a uh, student has completed a test segment, okay, in a test that prohibits navigation to previous segments, like that Math 6 test, or if their test has been paused for more than 20 minutes, um, returning to those items marked for review is not going to be allowed. So know that that 20 minute rule. Once paused does apply here. So that's why it's important with that scripting um, that talks about there's five minutes left in your testing session. That is a great time for students to go back and review those marked items for review. Because if they're still going to continue testing in a session on the following day, those uh, marked ones are no longer going to be available to them. Okay. During testing, uh, students can use the Zoom feature to increase the size of text and graphics. Uh, and then it just returns to a smaller size when they zoom out. An English glossary is available for students to use for ELA grades 3 through 5 um, on the reading passages and various items during testing. The students can access the glossary by clicking any of the pre-selected terms which are indicated on the screen with a gray dotted line. And when the student hovers over them with their mouse, it's going to highlight it in blue. If the student clicks on that highlighted term, a pop-up is going to appear with the definition of the term. Uh, the masking tool allows students to cover up any distracting area on the test page. They can click the masking button and then click and drag their mouse over any selected rectangular area of the screen. Once they've covered the portion they want to cover, um, they would need to deactivate masking mode by clicking that masking button again. And those masked areas remain on the screen even after masking mode is deactivated. If they want to remove the masked area, they just click the little X that's in the upper corner of that masked area. The Select Previous Version tool allows students to view and restore responses that they previously entered and saved for a text response item. To use this tool, students open the context menu for the text response item and click Select Previous Version. And then a window is going to appear listing any saved responses for the item and the text associated with each one. To view those previous responses, they select a response version in the left panel, and they can then read and review all of the associated text in the right panel. Um, to restore to one of those responses, the student would then click Select at the bottom of the window if they wanted to revert back to that previous version. Um, note that the Select Previous Version tool cannot restore responses that were entered prior to um, pausing a test. If a student has the Spanish adaptive version of the math or the science test enabled in TIDE, this little globe icon is going to appear. Okay, This is where the student can use the button as the toggle to change the language that's presented on the screen between English and Spanish. 
If your school plans to test over multiple days, you might need to have students pause their tests at a certain point so they can resume testing at another time. Um, you may also allow a pause if students are taking a break from testing, they need to leave the room uh, for a restroom break, anything like that. Um, whether they've been instructed to do so or not, students really can pause their test at any time by clicking that pause button in the upper, upper left corner, okay? When it comes to pausing tests, though, there are rules that apply. Um, for all tests that have been paused for less than 20 minutes, students can return from a short break in testing and revisit any items in the current test segment and change their answers if desired, okay? Students taking all tests except writing who have paused their tests for longer than 20 minutes are only going to be able to return to the most recent visited page that contains unanswered test items in the current test segment, okay? They can change any answers present on the page, but they're not going to be allowed to access any items on previous pages. Um, if all items on the most recently viewed page were answered prior to pausing, the student will be able to resume the test on the next page with unanswered items, and they are not going to be allowed to access previous pages or segments, okay? But writing tests can be revisited at any time. On a related note, as a security measure, after 20 minutes of test inactivity, students are gonna be logged out and their tests are gonna be paused automatically. So inactivity is determined by whether or not the student is interacting with the test by selecting answers or um, using the tools. So clicking empty space on the screen, that's not considered test activity, okay? Students are going to receive a warning message prior to being logged out, and they've got to click OK on that little pop-up within 60 seconds to avoid the automatic logout and pausing of their test. If a student's test is paused due to inactivity, the same rules apply as when the student intentionally pauses a test. The student can log into the test again, they can resume it from the point the test was interrupted, subject to that pause rule, okay? Um, additionally, if a screensaver is activated somehow during testing, the security breach feature is gonna log the student out of the test. So to avoid any such interruption, uh, we recommend that schools either deactivate screensavers before students start testing or ensure that screensavers are set um, to more than the allocated testing time so that that doesn't interfere. Uh, something else to be aware of, again, specific to the Math 6 test, I mentioned this earlier, it has two segments. So when students reach the end of the first test segment, they're going to receive a warning message asking them to confirm that they want to move on to the second segment. The warning also advises that they cannot return to change their answers in the current segment once they've moved on. So teachers need to ensure that students understand this outcome of like what occurs when ending the testing segment happens and just encourage students again to check their answers before moving on. Now the teacher will then need to approve the student before they can enter the second segment because that second segment is going to include the calculator global tool that was not provided to them in the first segment. When students answer the final question on the test, the end test button will appear in the upper left area of the screen, along with a message advising them that the test has been completed and is ready to be submitted. The end test button doesn't become visible until the student has selected at least one response to every question on the test, okay? If students click the next button at this point, they will see a pop-up message advising them to click the end test button when they've completed reviewing their answers. Uh, they may also click the back button to go back to revisit any of the previous items, okay? Uh, for writing tests, teachers need to be sure that students have completed the entire task before submitting their test. Because if students are taking a break during the writing test, whether it be for a few minutes or a few days, students need to pause their test, okay? If they click end test, that's it, it's submitting it. <laughs> so just be aware of that with the, with the writing test specifically. That end test button is going to appear on the screen as soon as students begin answering their prompt, okay? But they don't wanna click on that until they're ready to finish and submit the writing test. When students are ready again to end, they click the end test button, a pop-up is going to appear for allowing them to select yes if they're ready to finish and no if they're not. If a student clicks no, 
they will return to the last item of the test and they can revisit any of the other previous items with their arrows. If students click yes, they're going to be taken to the review screen where they have the choice to review their answers or submit the test. Um, their ability to review and change answers is still subject to that pause rule, though, if it's applicable. Um, this is also a great time to have some set procedures in place, like having students notify a teacher before submission. Um, the TAM has specific directions for ending tests. So if you have a really click happy student who submits a writing test before they're finished, please know it can be reopened. There is guidance in, um, in the TAM for you if that does occur. This was a long section. Do we have questions on testing tickets, monitoring test progr uh, progress, how to administer global tools? Um, I will ask if you are asking questions specific to remote administration that you hold on to those for our remote training that ha is happening February 22nd though. But anything regarding general administration, feel free to uh, dump those questions into our chat and we can address those. Uh, before we move on to reporting. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so we will continue with reporting. If something comes up, feel free to drop it in there. People are monitoring as I'm speaking. So for reporting, this is where you're going to find all of your student results. When you log into the reporting system, the first thing you see is the dashboard where you can view overall assessment results for all of your assessments listed by assessment. So teachers can also view um, a list of their students. Uh, the dashboard generator allows the user to determine which types of test groups they want to start with, as well as being able to default these selections for future logins. This screen will also allow for quick searching for specific SSIDs as well as changing various settings in the Features and Tools menu. So like changing reporting time period to look at historical RISE data or downloading student results as well as other functionality. Once you've selected the test groups and any relevant settings, you just click the Go to Dashboard button at the bottom and proceed. And then the selections chosen can be changed at any time by going back to the uh, Dashboard Generator link that's at the top left of the screen. It's important to note here that the teacher dashboard and the school um, admin or LEA dashboard do look slightly different. Okay, Users can see overall test results directly from their dashboard. This screen also shows the filters panel to the left of the tables. It expands to show options available to the user. Um, if you're not initially seeing the information you believe you should be seeing, double check your filters because oftentimes it's just because these are set um, to view a specific set of data that could be excluding what you're looking for. You can view performance by roster or by student using the tabs across the top. Um, we're going to start with roster and move on to student here in a bit. The first two fields will show the course and teacher. The next columns show student count, which is the number of students who took each test. Um, and then it shows the completion rate, which is how many students are currently finished. Um, the average score and the performance distribution and the percent proficient. The average score column lists the average raw score for that assessment and the performance distribution column shows the student's level of achievement based on mastery of standard. And you can use the little gray triangles across the top to sort by student count, uh, completion rate, the skill score, any of those things will sort. Because summative assessments have reporting category such, uh, sections, you can compare the performance of your schools in each reporting category. Um, you just click each of those colored vertical section bars to expand or collapse it. In this example, you can view a performance distribution bar for each roster under a reporting category. When making comparisons, though, be careful to take the student count into consideration uh, just to determine the value of the comparison. For summative assessments as well, you can also view strength and weakness designations for reporting categories in the performance by roster tab. Um, the strength and weakness designations compare an individual school's performance on a specific standard um, with the overall performance on the test. On each line, the comparison is relative to the individual student and utilizes various symbols to provide just a quick overview of student performance. So it's important to note that performance by item cannot be seen at any level with a summative assessment. 
Okay, users are only going to see strength or weaknesses at those aggregate levels for a summative test. If a plus sign is shown, that's an area of strength. Okay, if the equal sign is shown, that means that the performance on that standard is similar to performance on the test as a whole. If a negative sign is shown, it's an area of weakness. If there's an asterisk, it just indicates that it was that there was too insufficient of information. Um, this information can also be accessed on a more granular level by teachers for their own rosters and students who are assigned specifically to them. Um, when reviewing performance by student, the first two fields now show student names and SSIDs. The next columns show the scale scores and the performance di distribution and then the percent proficient. You'll notice those same colored vertical section bars will expand and provide more information regarding that standard. Uh, one of the other features included in the Features and Tools Waffle menu is the breakdown by button. This allows you to compare performance by the subgroups that are represented here. So you can make your selections and then move toward um, the download student results to export that information as a PDF, a zip, or CSV format. Okay, And these will go directly to that um, secure inbox, the secure file center, when, when it's ready for download. Um, the download student results box is also where you can print your ISRs that need to be provided to uh, parents within three weeks of test completion. You can also print uh, print those from that same screen. Okay. Summative assessments cover multiple reporting categories. So when you click that little eye icon, this performance level table is going to show up. It will also show the ranges for the scale score, which correlate to the proficiency level. So scores are shown as scale scores because a scale makes it possible to compare one student's score to another student's score, even if they didn't respond to the same questions, which is very realistic since our RISE summative test is adaptive. Okay, These scale scores are the same from year to year, and then there's um, a slide deck in the resources section of the RISE portal if you'd like more information regarding those cut scores for uh, any and all subjects and grades, okay? The scale score is then given a, perf a performance distribution by proficiency. So proficiency levels describe how students applied the content-specific knowledge and skills as outlined through the Utah core on those four different performance levels. Um, anytime you're reviewing or interpreting student score information on the RISE Summative Writing Assessment specifically, please note that there are three categories that student responses are scored on. So you've got conventions, evidence and elaboration, statement of purpose and organization. Know that the scale score range varies across writing prompts because the difficulty of the writing prompt also varies. So students may have the same number of rubric points, for example, if they have a rubric score of six out of 10, but they might receive a different performance level due to the varying difficulty of the prompts that they were um, that they were shown. Okay, the individual student report identifies the genre of the writing prompt that the student received, um, but due to item security, specific information about which prompt the student responded to is not available. But you can access the rubric scores. Okay. We would highly encourage teachers to review those ISRs, those individual student reports, for their students. Um, the performance level standards used to classify writing, you've got below standard and then at or near and then above. New for this new, uh, our spring administration, CAI has implemented improved reporting on writing summative tests. Okay. So users may now see their students' writing dimension reporting data at the individual student level directly in the reporting, okay? This will provide you some more granular detail on the points student received in each of the writing domains. So you'll see this on writing tests when they go live in March. When it comes to generating those ISRs or the individual student report um, for a writing assessment, you are going to use the student results generator. Each ISR will show a student's performance on their writing assessment, okay? The student results generator presents a series of panels in which to select options. So depending on what page you start from, just know that some of the options might be pre-selected. 
but you just need to select the desired filtering options. Then select students. Uh, that section contains the list of rosters. So I can either select an entire roster or a selection of students from the list, or I can even enter a specific um, SSID into that search bar. From the two reporting type options in the panel on the right, you'll select the option for ISRs, and then the selections section is gonna show the number of ISRs to be generated, and more options will appear below that. So if you're generating multiple ISRs under the report format, choose either the single PDF for the ISRs or um, a zip file, which will contain a separate PDF for each one. If you select single PDF, the student results generator might create a zip file of multiple PDFs, depending on the number of um, schools, grades, opportunities, those types of things, okay? But then once your selections are made, you just click Generate, and once the ISR generation is finished, it's gonna be in your Secure File Center available for you to download and print. Do we have any questions on RISE reporting? If a question creeps up, you can just drop it there in the chat with reporting. If not, we will move on to the test appeals process. So test appeal requests are a way to interrupt the normal flow of testing submissions to reporting. So for example, a student may need to get back into a segment that they incorrectly exited or have a grace period extension applied if they had to pause their test and didn't have time to review. Um, a test administrator may want to invalidate a test because of an issue with academic dishonesty. Um, a student may have completed a test without issue, but then obtained a parental exclusion letter after the fact, which is going to require that test to then be invalidated. Okay, all of those things require um, a test appeal request. So you'll need to access those through TIDE. These need to be submitted at least one day prior to the end of your testing window so that the student still has the opportunity to complete the test. Once the appeal has been requested, an LEA level user will then need to go and review the appeal request status. Okay, there's a myriad of test appeals to choose from. As you're deciding which type of appeal to create or review, it's important to understand that if you invalidate the test, it eliminates the testing opportunity completely. It's no longer going to appear as a test for the student. So be familiar with the descriptions for each of these when you create the appeals and then when you go and either approve or deny them. So you can create an appeal request by doing the following. You select Create Appeal Requests, and then the Create Appeal Request page is going to appear. You'll be able to select a request type and then just select Search. Tide is then going to display the found results at the bottom of the Create Appeals page request. You just then mark the checkbox for each result that you want the appeal applied to. From the selection, from the select a reason from the top list dropdown, you just select a reason for creating the appeal request. The reasons may vary based on the appeal request type, okay? You just enter the reason for the request in the window that pops up, select submit, and then Tide is going to display a confirmation page. As an LEA user, you then either approve or reject that appeal that's been created. Um, for what it's worth, you can also view, retract, or um, export existing appeal requests, okay? Um, from the appeal request task menu on the TIDE dashboard, you just select view, approve, approve, export appeal requests, and then that page will appear. Um, to retrieve the appeal requests you want to view by filling out the search criteria, you just select it through the search there. You may want to review the reason for the appeal request by selecting the little green quotation button that appears in the request status column. Um, to ap approve the appeals, you'll select the appeal to be approved and then click the process button when it's ready. You follow this very same procedure if you're going to reject or retract that appeal, okay? Just note, this is a two-step procedure. Um, a lot of times we find that LEA level users will create the appeal request, but then they forget that they also need to go in and either approve 
or um, reject those. Okay, so make sure that you're completing both steps. I would recommend checking for these appeals uh, when we get into the testing season on a daily basis. Okay, right now you can probably get away with it a couple of times a week, if not weekly. But once your testing window opens, you definitely want to be checking for these daily. Um, there's also guidance included in the Tide User Guide on how to do this um, with appeals requests at all at once with an up with a file upload if you're interested. Um, it's important to monitor test progress and enter those participation codes throughout the testing window as testing progresses rather than after testing's all the way complete. However, after testing, LEA level users need to use um, Tide to use cleanup for their uh, for their data. Okay, so this data cleanup menu in the blue after testing section of the dashboard then becomes your friend. In the data cleanup menu, the discrepancy resolution page allows LEA level users to view and clean up test discrepancies where students were eligible to test within the testing window but didn't take it. So an LEA level user is going to clean up this data by entering a participation code, okay? To do this, you first fill out the fields given, okay? Hit search. The results of the search are going to be generated. They're gonna show students within the search criteria, those who were eligible for summative test at any point, but who have not started, okay? Next, you'll select the tools icon button to resolve the discrepancy and then a new page is going to appear. You'll need to select the edit pencil to assign a participation code to the students that are listed in that row. And then um, the assign non-participation code page is going to appear after that. You'll use the drop-down menu uh, that's there to assign the participation code to the student as applicable. Just click save when complete, and then a confirmation screen is gonna appear confirming that the, the discrepancy has been resolved. Just as a reminder here, you should be entering participation codes for students throughout the window um, rather than waiting just until test cleanup, okay? Um, LEA level users, you should be talking to your school administrators and teachers in your LEA about this process. Just set up some communication channels so that this information is relayed appropriately. So if you're waiting until after testing to clean up this testing data, you should be using the discrepancy resolution reports in the data cleanup section of TIDE two weeks prior um, to the test window closing for the LEA or school. Um, just as a reminder, all of those participation codes have to be submitted, done, cleaned up um, within the two weeks after. And Eric, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's June 10th. Is that correct for this year? Uh, that sounds correct. Give me one sec here. Uh, June 2024. So the window closes, I believe, on the 7th, which is a Friday. Um, so 10th will be that Monday. So. Does that follow our previous from years past? I feel like it does. Yeah, it does. Okay, okay. It's right over here, yep. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> so yes, make sure that all of your uh, participation codes are submitted, ready to go, cleaned up by June 10th, okay? Just know it's always best to do this in the process of assigning those participation codes while students are still in school um, so that users can have students finish or take a test that may have been discovered was missed inadvertently, okay? Um, when it comes to adding participation codes, LEA level users can add those for multiple students in a single upload. You'll just need to enter all of the SSIDs and their corresponding participation codes into an Excel or CSV file um, there are templates that are available um, uh, from Tide, and then you just make your changes and upload the entire file back into Tide in one action, okay? Just note that this task requires a lot more familiarity with CSV files and working with Microsoft Excel. So if that's not something that you are as comfortable with, I wouldn't recommend this option. But there is more guidance in the RISE Tide Guide. Um, if it is something that you are interested in. I'm gonna outline the process here so that if you want to try it, you are welcome to. Um, you'll just select the option from the menu and then your upload page is going to appear, okay? You'll upload your file with the SSIDs and their corresponding participation codes. If you've not saved the template on your device, you will need to download one, just like any other Tide upload file. Okay, the template upload is pre-configured 
with the RISE assessments and as well as the um, participation codes. Just take some time to preview the file, but if there are any errors when you go to upload it, it is going to be flagged in that validation step. Um, a common error as seen here occurs when trying to apply participation codes to a test that a student wasn't eligible to take. So these errors would need to be fixed, and then you would need to re-upload the revised file for those changes to be reflected if you choose to use this way, okay? Do we have any questions regarding test appeals or data cleanup? If there are no questions, the last slide here has the RISE help desk information, as well as my contact information and Jessica and Maureen's contact information as well for your rostering and your accommodations questions. If there are no questions from you, you are welcome to dismiss with us. Thank you for attending. However, if you do have questions, we are happy to stay on for the next few minutes and answer anything that you may want to ask, okay? So for those of you who might be departing, thank you again so much for participating. But if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we will assist you. Robin, you are thank you. Thank you so much for attending. You're welcome. Jumana, same, same. Thank you for attending. I appreciate all of the work that you guys do as well. <laughs> Again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. This is a great time. Or if it's easier, you're welcome to send an email um, to myself. If it's for rostering, you can send it to Maureen and I, accommodations to Jessica and I. If an email is better, that's also fine as well. You're welcome. Oh, Derek, thanks. It's so fun to see familiar names and faces. <laughs> At least you might want to talk about people are asking about getting copies of the slides. Yes. So with copies of slides, I will get them into a PDF form and Emily can send them through Midas. And then I will also link them in the AD memo that can be sent out. Um, I will also link them for our AD meeting next week. Um, if, if for whatever reason, Jennifer, you don't end up getting them in one of those um, formats, you're also welcome to email me and I can send them to you directly. You're welcome. Thank you so much for your participation.